from the Chicago Sun-Times newsroom, I'm Natasha Karecki, and this is Off Message, our weekly politics show. Governor-elect Bruce Rauner just met with both of the leaders. Is this a good first step? They actually sat down and spoke after Rauner has been pretty much vilifying the two of them for the last, I don't know, year? Well, this is one of the ugliest campaigns that we've seen, and I think this is just going to be the nature of campaigns moving forward. Uh, they're tough and uh, they're very personal, but the fact is that the election's over. Bruce Rauner is the governor-elect. And uh, the fact that the Speaker and the President of the Senate have met with Bruce Rauner today I think is extremely important. I think it sends a message that he is uh, going to put what happened in the campaign aside and he needs to move Illinois forward. I think it's a great sign and uh, I think there will be more of that as we get into session and start the work of the, the people next year. So do you think that John Cullerton and Mike Madigan are able to put aside all, the, all that ugliness? They are all professionals. They have been through this before. I have no doubt that they'll be able to work together in the best interest of the state. There will be cooperation, there will be confrontation, but everyone knows how this works and looking forward to the, uh, the prospects. Mike Madigan is a bloodless man. He's still the most powerful guy in the state no matter who's governor, and so he wasn't crying himself to sleep through all these ads were running, I, you know. So he's still going about his business. Uh, I, I think he's managed to. Just remember that the relationship between uh, Governor Quinn and also the Speaker and the President of the Senate hasn't exactly been, you know, the most wonderful relationship either. So this is nothing new. The dynamics are a lot different, though, because there are now checks and balances in Springfield. First Republican governor in 12 years. The last time you were on the show, you swore to us you would pick up a couple of seats. But I believe we'll do better than one. I think that we're apt to win three or four. That did not happen. No. So we are now moving forward with the scenario that Democrats have their veto-proof majority. We lost the race. We were running up against a tough map. We were outspent, but I think we did everything we could to be competitive. That's life. And the fact is, uh, I've told my members, the buck stops with me. We'll learn from what happened uh, last Tuesday. Uh, and we need but what does this mean for moving forward with, with a Governor sure. Rauner who's Republican? How does he... It's going to be through a bipartisan uh, you know, negotiation and meetings. There will be a lot of meetings this next year, but the fact is 70 would have been great, 69 would have been symbolic. It would have helped uh, Governor Rauner on issues regarding overrides of vetoes. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do still believe that there's independent votes on the Democrat side of the aisle which will be able to work with us on some really important issues that we think are... Uh, the right thing to do. You were the chief sponsor for the same-day voter registration. Yes, I was. There was a lot of issues with same-day voter re registration in the city, and some have even said that that ended up unexpectedly sort of suppressing some of the vote because of the long lines. Do you think that, that that's true, for uh, first of all? No, I don't. I think same-day uh, voter registration was a stunning success. If there was any failure, it was the um, inability to predict the enormous demand for it. In the city, there were five separate locations for same-day registration and voting. The long lines were there. They didn't impede people from voting at their polling places. But the demand was extraordinary. I think that's a, a true testament to the success. I think in the next uh, election cycle, we'll be able to anticipate that. It worked out very well in the suburbs. There were 18 uh, locations in suburban Cook County. There were lines, but all those people were able to register and to vote. And anytime you expand the franchise, that's a good thing. Well, how do you change that up? I mean, do you expand the number of sites? Absolutely. Absolutely. And in, in the end, I think we do want to get to the point where the technology is there and you could do it in your own polling place. We don't have the technology to do that seamlessly yet, but I think we will. In the interim, I, I think this is clearly a validation that people get engaged in elections late and we should encourage them to participate. We've had the lowest uh, turnout in, since 1942 and so I can't be considered a success, but one thing that we have found is that states that make it easier to vote, more people vote. And so I think anything that's going to make it uh, less of an ordeal to get to the, to the ballot to exercise your constitutional right, I think is important. And uh, looking across the country, not every state has done things to try to make it easier for people to vote. And, and it's something I think is very important for us to keep in mind. Okay, well, let's move to why the two of you are here, which is we're looking forward at the veto session. And what is going to happen with the minimum wage, in your opinion? Uh, I, I support uh, the uh, increase in the minimum wage. I would uh, counsel action on that during the veto session. I know the legislative leaders are surveying our members to see if, uh, if we can do that. The minimum wage referendum passed by a wider margin than any candidate on the ballot. And uh, the question is, shall we raise it before January 1st? Even Bruce Rauner voted for that. So I hope that we take that up and pass that and uh, move on to the next challenge. I have a feeling you don't think the same way. Uh, you know what, I've talked with the Speaker and I was with the President of the Senate earlier in the day and I don't believe we will see a vote on the minimum wage during the veto session. If the Speaker wanted to pass a minimum wage, he had the 71 votes to do it. But they didn't. I think they're nervous about it. It was, I believe it was put on the ballot to drive out the base. And I think that we should wait for a new administration 
uh, after Bruce Rauner gets sworn in on a very important and a big issue in the state of Illinois to work with him and to try to find the right balance. That referendum passed overwhelmingly in even very suburban, very Republican districts, including in DuPage County. Isn't this a mandate now by the people? And, and, and that question, question did say January 1st, 2015. So it doesn't really matter what people vote on. No, that's not true. But I think that it's one of those questions was, of course, the, the, they knew what the result was going to be. It's an easy question, and it's one that the public is the way it's, it was presented to them. Of course, it's meant to elicit a positive response. But I, I disagree. I don't okay. think it was a foregone conclusion that it would be earning 60 percent plus of the vote in DuPage County, in counties all over the state. That was an overwhelming mandate from every pocket of Illinois. I think it's incumbent upon us to follow up on Pat Quinn's lead and make the will of the people the law of the land. Well, do you think that you can get enough members to move on this before January? I think we can pass it in the Senate. Um, the House is, a, is a, uh, another body. I, I haven't done a vote count there. But I, I believe that we could uh, do what we told the people we were going to do. And by the way, does anyone care that Pat Quinn really wants this to be, you know, the last big thing that he passes before he leaves office? He does. <laughs> uh, but let me just say here, I don't believe we need to go down to Springfield in January for a lame duck session. I would hope that the Speaker and the President of the Senate extend a courtesy to the incoming governor and not go through the things we did four years ago, where you have legislators who are on their way out, they're lame ducks, Phones are disconnected, their leases in their office have expired, and there's no little or no interplay with their constituents. And I think it would be a great gesture for the Democrat leadership to say that, you know what, we're not going to call people in in January before the uh, new administration and the General Assembly gets sworn in. What's the likelihood that there will be a lame duck session? I don't know if we can take care of our routine housekeeping in, uh, in November and December. I don't think it's clear that there will be a, a session in January. Uh, what I would want to ask you guys about, the, the, the thing I'm looking at is the ride-sharing veto. Because uh, a lot of people in our viewership, they use Uber and there's sort of this battle going on. And I was wondering if you had any insight in, into whether or not they're going to overturn the veto of the law involving insurance and background checks for rideshare. I do believe it will be called in the House. The motion will be filed to override the governor's veto. And that will, we may take that up next week. I do believe it will be called for a vote, though. I think it will be closer than the actual vote that was taken last spring. I know that the, uh, uh, the groups, uh, Lyft and uh, Uber, have uh, uh, lobbied up. They've got a lot of people working on it. And uh, there's been a lot of activity over the last, just as much of the election. Oh, that's probably the next biggest election is how this one's going to play out. But I, I can't predict how it's going to, uh, if, whether or not there's votes to uh, override the governor's veto. It was a substantial margin in the original vote, but I know that it's kind of narrowed a little bit from what I understand. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the state income tax increase sunsets January 1st. Is that going to come up at all in the next couple of months? How does it how does it come up? I think it's safe to assume that the temporary tax increase from a few years ago will expire at the end of the year. But this is where there needs to be a true uh, beginning of this bipartisan cooperation to try to be able to solve not only the six-month budget, but also we're going to go into the next fiscal year we got to start with as well. I will say this, that you know there's a lot of things on the table, and uh, we're going to have to make some very difficult decisions. I imagine it's going to be a tough session, but the fact is that's what we were elected for. That's why we go down there is to take the tough votes. But we need to balance the budget. We need to do it fair and responsibly. Do you see any scenario that wouldn't include raising that income tax again? How do you come up with enough money to balance the budget and have a legal budget? I, I agree uh, with Leader Durkin that the, the temporary tax rates are going to roll back on January 1st. We're eagerly awaiting uh, Governor-elect Rauner's first budget address. The fact is divided government has its uh, virtues and its vulnerabilities. We, we are not going to be able to do the sort of dramatic things we've been able to do with uh, Democratic majorities and a Democratic governor, but we will be able to do the nuts and bolts of government in a bipartisan fashion. And there's nothing more important than dealing with the budget and the revenue. For more than a decade, we have passed Democratic budgets supported by Democratic revenue proposals. This is a chance for my Republican colleagues to engage, and I, I think you guys are going to have a harder time than we are because you can no longer be the party of no. You're going to have to vote for difficult things. You're going to have to sponsor difficult things. It hasn't been Republicans or party of no. It was Republicans who were very much engaged and involved with Senate Bill 1, state pension reform. Uh, was House Republicans were very involved. We put a lot of votes on the Chicago pension reform. I have personally have taken it upon myself that we don't, we're not going to be a caucus of no. And we haven't been. We've worked on a lot of issues together. We'll continue to do that with Senator Culleton, Senator Harmon. Uh, it's going to be a challenging year, but we want to work to find the solutions to the problems. I mean, but it's well, real simple. Well, can you guys answer? I mean, do you think that our state income tax is going to increase in the next session again? I can't answer that question. 
I'm not going to get in front of Bruce Rauner on this. I want to see how he lays it out in his budget address. I think we have to give him that courtesy and that you know, and let him lay out his plan of how we're going to be able to deal with this situation. And Governor Rauner did, or Governor-elect Rauner did uh, propose a broad expansion of the sales tax to cover services. Right. I, I don't know exactly how he would uh, lay that out. We're eager to hear if that's an alternative to the income tax. But I, I don't know how we provide base government services that people count on without ensuring rev revenues are adequate to, to pay for and them. And so you are saying that you, you see a scenario where it's necessary to increase the state income tax? I, I think that this is going to be a Republican uh, budget. And to Jim's point, the, the, you, get, you have changed the, the, the tenor of the conversation in Springfield. I think the Senate Republicans are going to have a more difficult time. They have fairly routinely voted no on most everything, but they're going to have to stand up and vote for difficult things. Sure. Do you think that no matter what, that Rauner is going to have to eat some of his words? At well, I love the, Jim used the word courtesy. I thought of the Shakespeare line, killing with kindness, okay, because what it is is that they're not going to make his job easy for him. He's swept into office with these promises to cut back things, which is literally impossible to do without crippling the state, and the, the legislature is not going to go bail him out now. So if he indeed intends to do this, either he has to do it, which would be disastrous, or he has to do 180 degrees, which I think the smart money expects him to do in some convoluted form. I don't want to close out yet without um, recognizing that a former longtime Republican congressman, Phil Crane, died earlier this week. You knew him well yes. and, and looked up to him, and I, I just wanted to see if you had any closing thoughts. Well, you know what? I met him in 2002 when I ran in a very forgettable year for the Republican Party <laughs> for the U.S. Senate, but he was an absolute gentleman after I won, and he, uh, I met with him a number of times in Washington told me about his thoughts and what he has seen in the state, different parts of the region. And he was an absolute gentleman through that, through that election. And uh, I, I just became friends with him after that. And he'll be missed. He was a strong voice, uh, clearly a person who was prepared to debate the issues, who felt that there was uh, a need and a strong need for conservative values. He has made his mark in Washington and also in the state of Illinois. It certainly did. OK, with that, let's close out with our quotes of the week. And um, Neil, why don't we start? Well, uh, the big surprise this week was the Chinese-American Accord on Global Warming, which uh, holds out the prospect of actually saving the Earth from complete destruction. And uh, the Republicans, of course, House Speaker John Boehner cast it this way, the latest example of the president's crusade against affordable, renewable energy, meaning Barack Obama hates coal, which I thought was an interesting take on it. <laughs> okay, Senator Hunt. Uh, my quote comes from our general election ballot. Shall the minimum wage in Illinois for adults over the age of 18 be raised to $10 per hour by January 1st, 2015? And what do you have? Well, you know what? I don't have my piece of paper, piece of paper in front of me, but I just want to mark, mark, mark Tressman's comments in the locker room <laughs> at Green Bay that he sees a lot of promise in this team and uh, things, uh, you know, that things are you know, really good for the uh, moving forward for the Bears organization. So I felt that his uh, very positive statement in the Bears locker room after being annihilated uh, was, I'll, I'll use that as my quote of the week. And mine will go to um, John Patterson, who is uh, John Cullerton's spokesman. I spoke with him right after uh, the leaders all met with Bruce Rauner, and I asked him if Rauner brought up Madigan and Cullerton's 100 years of failure, and uh, he said, I don't think that came up. <laughs> so with that, thank you very much to our panel for joining thank us you. this week, and thank you. We will see you next week on Off Message.